seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Meeting House Church. Glad you're here. How you doing? You doing good? Yeah? Um, happy Mother's Day, moms. And uh, we kind of just made it Woman's Day here, right? Did everybody get a rose? Everybody, all the ladies? Good. All the single ladies? Did you get a rose too? Right? <laughs> I tell you what, I am so glad that God created women because, I mean, let's face it, guys, the world would be just like a big, smelly locker room, right? That would, be, that would basically be the essence of, of the world, would be a big locker room. Dirty socks, underwear, you know, plates with food, you know, week old sitting on that. That would be the world. And, and God, of course, looked at that and said, no, that's not good. So he created women, right? He, he, created, he created moms, he created ladies, and uh, ladies, you make the world a better place. That's all I have to say. Uh, you make the world a better place, and so happy Mother's Day to you. Um, did I introduce myself yet? My name's James Thomason, and this is your first time here with us, and I am glad a pastor here at Meeting House Church. As Chad said, if this is your first time, we have, a, we have a little gift over there at the information table. After the service, please make your way over there. We'd love to, uh, to give you that. <clears throat> but we are in a Power to Change series. Uh, that's the series we're in right now. And in this series, we're looking at four different sources of God's power to change us in our lives. God's power to change you, God's power to change me, God's, God's power to change your life, God's power to change my life. And, and uh, those four sources are, number one, God's Son. That's where we started on Easter, right? God's Son is the power to change our relationship with God, with Him. You see, God created us, He created you, He created me for an open door relationship with Him. He created us actually to live and be His sons and daughters, right? We looked at that. That was Easter. And, and uh, the problem with this, with, with this situation is, is every one of us have closed our door on God. Every one of us, and, and the Bible calls that sin. We've sinned against God. We've said, God, thank you, you know, but no thanks. I got my own stuff. You know, we've all gone our, gone our own way, the Bible says. And, and, and that, that's a problem. God says that, that sin cuts us off from Him. And because He's holy, because God, because sin is wrong and it hurts us and, it, and it's not good, God is holy. And because God is holy, He closed His door on the relationship. But we celebrate Easter and we, and we worship on Sunday mornings because Sunday and Easter are the day that we celebrate what? Jesus' death and resurrection. And so here's the big deal about Easter. It's not Easter eggs. It's not chocolate. Those are good things. It's not bunnies. But Jesus' death and resurrection did this for us. Jesus... Through his death and resurrection, he threw God's door wide open to you and me and everyone. And this is the situation that we all find ourselves naturally in life. God's door wide open through the love, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our door closed. And of course we saw Revelation. Jesus says, behold, I... Stand at the door and knock, right? If anyone opens that door and lets me in, I will come in to him. I will, I will save him. That, that salvation. We open our door to Jesus Christ by repenting and believing in him. By, by saying, God, I don't want that closed door relationship anymore. I'm turning away from, from me and my way. I'm going to do it your way. You know, no more Frank Sinatra. Um, I'm going to do it your way now. That's, that's how we do it. I believe that Jesus is the one who died and rose again to open your door for me. 
please forgive me. And when we do that, when we come to that point in our lives, that's when salvation occurs. That's when the scriptures say our relationship with God changes. But that's not all that changes. Um, God actually moves in and takes up residence in us at that point. He changes us. So that's God's Son. God's Word uh, was, last, was a couple weeks ago. We need to take God's Word in to us. We need to, we need to renew our minds. We need, to, we need to grow in our relationship with Him. We need to, when we do that, when we, when we read, study, meditate on God's Word, God renews our mind, and that transforms us. That changes us. God's Word is power to change us. And then God's people, that's next week. God's people, the local church, are power to change. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because He is power. He is the one who changes us. And, and he, he has power to make change, to encourage us, to empower us, to strengthen us, to enable us to continue to grow and change. And so when we open our door to Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit moves in and, and, and His address becomes our address. He moves inside of us. Let's look at that. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter has, uh, the Apostle Peter just just finished the sermon, thousands of people, and, and he finishes and they say to Peter, what should we do in response to what he said? What should we do, Peter? And Peter says this. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we open our door. Repent, right? That's what we just said. Repent. We open our door to Jesus Christ. That's the first step. That's, that's salvation. The next step of following Jesus, the very first step after we open our door to Him, is to be baptized. By the way, baptism class, June 1, right? <laughs> immediately after this service. Baptism, June 8th, immediately after the this service, or no, we're going to have that in between services on June 8th. So, in other words, if you've opened your door to Jesus Christ and have not been baptized since then, you need to come to baptism and membership class. You need to be baptized on, on, on June 8th. That's what God says. When we do that, when we open our door, the Holy Spirit comes in. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? And He makes us a brand new person. He gives us a new heart, a new person on the inside. Let's look at that in Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. A new person with a new heart. God says, I will give you a what? New heart. And I will put a what? New spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit where? in you. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So when we open our door to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit moves in, makes us a new person, gives us a new heart, new spirit, right? And moves us to follow <coughs> God's word. The Holy Spirit is the power He's the one who empowers us to live a righteous life, to live a godly life, to make change in our life, and much, much more, much, much more. I want you to look at this list of ten changes the Holy Spirit made in you. If you've opened your door to Jesus Christ, this list of ten things, God did them the moment you opened that door. If you haven't opened your door to Jesus Christ, then if you open your door, when you open your door to God, He will make all of these changes in you immediately. Okay? Let's look at that list. Ten changes the Holy Spirit makes in me. Number one, He gives me new and eternal life. Immediately. It's not something you get over time. It's not something you work for. It's a gift of God. It gives me access to God. 
He opens the door so I can come to God in prayer. He prays with me. Did you know that? As a believer, when you pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes with God on your behalf. He guarantees, excuse me, He justifies and sanctifies me. Justifies means He makes me innocent of my sin. Sanctifies means He makes me holy. He sets me apart for God. He guarantees my salvation. The Holy Spirit is a, a stamp, a seal, guaranteeing the, your salvation. He sets you free from sin. He baptizes us. He fills us with God's love. He empowers us for life. And He gives us spiritual gifts to serve <coughs> our church. Ten things. The moment you open your door to Jesus Christ, every one of those and more happens to you. They're true whether you know them or not. They're true whether you believe them or, or not. They're true if you, if you behave like they are or if you haven't. They're true if you feel like they're true or if you feel like they're not true. They're true. They're real. That's why we believe them. These, this is what God has done in you and for you. They'll never change. Because the Holy Spirit has guaranteed your salvation. That's the new you. The new resources that God has given you. Because, by His grace. Because you opened your door to Jesus Christ. But I want you to see, that's not all. That's not all the Holy Spirit has power to do in your life. Has power to do in you. It's not all the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. I looked up, I studied everything the New Testament says to do that, that the Holy Spirit wants to do in life. 43 different things, the scripture says. So we've been, we've been going through some lists in this series, right? We're going to look at a list right now of 20, 20 things the Holy Spirit has power to do in you. 20 things that the Holy Spirit has power to do in me and in our lives. All right, now we're going to do what we've been doing. I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to ask you to read these out loud with some excitement, with some enthusiasm, because this is what God wants to do with you. It's what He wants to do in you, okay? <laughs> 20 things the Holy Spirit has power to do in me. The Holy Spirit has power to fill me, lead me in life, give me hope, Give me wisdom and revelation. Counsel and encourage me. Teach me God's word. Guide me into truth. Strengthen me when I'm weak. Empower me to live righteously, peacefully, and joyfully. Empower me to grasp God's love. Empower me to worship God. Empower me to overcome sin. Empower me to witness for Christ. Make me indispensable to growing my church. Perform miracles in my life. Speak to me. Speak through me. Convince me of my guilt. Give me the mind of Christ. Bear this fruit and more in me. Good job. Give yourself a hand. Good work. Good work. Nice enunciation, pronunciation, <laughs> all those things. Hey, look, all the, every, that's what God wants to do in you through the Holy Spirit. Every one of those things, all that power is real. It's available to you. It's at, it, you know, if we can say it's, it's at your fingertips, it's at your disposal, but it's not guaranteed. That first list of ten things, guaranteed. The Holy Spirit moves in, you open your door, boom, Holy Spirit's in, you're saved, you're made a new creation. But these, to one extent or another, depend on the quality of my relationship with God. The quality of your relationship with God. You see... I can have access to God. God gives me access, gives you access when we become His children, right? 
but we may not use that access. We may not draw strength uh, and, 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 and encouragement through prayer and God's Word from it. God, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He'll, he'll guide us in life. He'll teach us God's Word. He'll lead us. But if we don't listen, if we don't follow, then we don't benefit. The Holy Spirit is in us. He takes up residence in us. But we may not be filled up with the Holy Spirit. You see, the, 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 the extent to which you and I experience this work of the Holy Spirit is really dependent on the quality of our relationship with God in a big way. See, we can minimize the Holy Spirit's power in us. We can limit the good things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And we can do that in two ways. The first way we can do that is by grieving the Holy Spirit. By grieving the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at that in Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What does grieve mean? What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? The word the, the, the grieve means to cause physical or emotional pain. We can cause pain for the Holy Spirit. How do we, how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Uh, well, the, the surrounding verses say we, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we, uh, when, we, when we use unwholesome talk. When we, uh, when we tear other people down with our words. When we're, when we're critical instead of building others up and encouraging. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we, when we gossip or slander or fight. Those things grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, sin isn't just the breaking of God's law. It's also the wounding of God's heart. It's sin hurts, grieves the Holy Spirit. So in the same way that when someone betrays you, lies to you, and it hurts you, or, or to me, it hurts us, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, it hurts the Holy Spirit the same way. The Holy Spirit knows what it is, what it feels like to be snubbed, to be neglected, to be rejected, to be disobeyed. That's, that's the idea. The Holy Spirit, see, is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. He can... He, So that's, that's the first way we can, we, can, uh, we, can, we can limit the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Another way is we quench the Spirit's fire. Or put out the Spirit's fire. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's look at this. Do not put out the Spirit's fire, the Bible says. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. See, the Holy Spirit in Scripture is characterized as fire. It even appears as fire in the Scriptures. It's, it's, it's God's power and God's glory. That's the idea there. The Holy Spirit is powerful. It's not only God's, God's glory and, and God's power, but it also, uh, the Spirit's fire also represents our excitement, our intensity, the intensity, the enthusiasm the fervency of our, of our worship and service, of our love for God. That's the Spirit's fire. And the Bible says, don't, don't quench that. Don't put it out. Don't be a wet blanket on the Holy Spirit's fire. How do we, how do, we do that? Well, it says, don't despise prophecies. Uh, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. In general, we, we, we quench the Holy Spirit when we, when we diminish when we downgrade, when we have contempt for the unique ministry and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when we, when we try to be a wet blanket or, or bring somebody down the side who's psyched up and fired up and filled with the Holy Spirit, about filled with excitement about God. You know, we like to do that sometimes, don't we? You ever do that? Somebody comes up to you, maybe a new believer, or somebody just, oh, you can't believe what God is doing in my life. Oh, God is so awesome. And you're just like, you know, I, I, 
I need to take you down a couple of notches. Let me, let me, let me clue you in on reality. You know, let me bring your feet back down on the ground. You ever done that? Let me bring you down a notch or two, right? That's, that's quaint. Don't, don't, don't be a wet blanket. Don't, don't be a party pooper. Don't throw a bucket of water on the Spirit's fire. That's quenching the Holy Spirit. How else do we do that, you know? We do it, we're, 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 we're praising God, maybe we're praying to Him, maybe you're reading His Word, uh, maybe it's here in church and we're singing, and, and God begins, the Holy Spirit begins to fill you up, and, and you feel like, man, I, you know, you, you want to you wanna, you wanna do away with that self-consciousness and, and worship God, and, and, and oh, and, oh, and we cool. You got to, oh, I've got to manage the Holy Spirit. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to keep up appearances. I've got to keep, you know. We put our, po our hands in our pockets and, 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 and we try to control and, 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 and put out the enthusiasm and the fervency of the, that the Holy Spirit has kindled in us. God gives you an idea, a thought. Man, I should, I should share the love of God. I should share the gospel with this person. Oh, no, that's too risky. Better, put, better throw, throw some water on that deal, right? Uh, maybe I should, I should help here. Maybe I should give here. Maybe I should... No, that, that's just too... That's crazy. That's bad. Better throw some water. That's what it means to quench the Holy Spirit's fire. We're not supposed to do that. Instead, we're supposed to test everything and hold on to the good. Test everything. So we're not talking about mindlessness here. We're not talking about being crazy. We test everything. Test. If somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, God told me to tell you so and so. Okay. Well, what did he say? Uh-huh. Well, I, let me test that. How do we test it? This is the litmus test. Right here. If it agrees with this, well, test it. Don't despise it. Maybe it's right. I mean, have you ever, as pastor, I, um, I get this more than I would like. You know, oh, Pastor James, you know, God has told me, and we're going to, and I'm going to, and, oh, you know, wow, I hate, I don't want to be a, a wet blanket on the spirit, but what you just said doesn't even come close to agreeing with this, God's word, so I'm I don't, I don't really think that's the Holy Spirit telling you to do that. I always start off soft like that. <laughs> you know, gosh, I don't want to, you know, but that's not, Holy Spirit telling me to go down to Foxwood and and can't put it all on number 21. <laughs> Let's test that. Let's make sure. You following me? It's got to agree with this. The Holy Spirit is the author of the scriptures. So whatever the Holy Spirit says agrees with, with this, with God's word. Uh, Christy and I, when we were... Uh, young in marriage, uh, thought, you know, how do we decide, you know, whether or not we should do, have you ever been going along and you just get this idea, I should, I should in some way bless this person. You know, I should, oh, well, God, I should, I should get, I should, I should talk to this person. I should share the gospel with this person. I should pray for this person. I should, I, I think this person needs something. I should give them something. You ever have those thoughts and ideas? And we'd say, well, how do we know? You know, how do we know if that's God or not? Well, and what we decided is, if, if we have that thought and, and it agrees with this, then it's the Holy Spirit, because this is God's Word. So go for it. You know, if I have two jackets and I see somebody and it's wintertime and they don't have a jacket, and I think, wow, I should give one of my jackets to that person, that's the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. If you have two and you come across somebody who has none, then you give them one of yours. No brainer. Easy to decide. So we, we can quench the Spirit's uh, fire. Instead, we're supposed to test, then hold on to what is good. 
So that's what's not to do. Don't do that. Don't quench. Don't grieve. Now let's talk about what to do. How do we access the Holy Spirit? How do we, how do we get in touch with, how do, we, how do we relate with the Holy Spirit in such a way that, that He accomplishes and does everything He wants to do in us and, and for us and through us? How is it that we, that we get the strength that we need to make the changes that we would like to make in life, that God would like us to make in life? Two commands, two more commands. Four commands in Scripture regarding the Holy Spirit. Don't quench. Don't grieve. The next one, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is the key, folks. It is the key to having the, the presence, the power, the work, the encouragement, the joy, all of the, that list of 20 things. That's the key. It's the key to not quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It means to be completely controlled by. That's the idea. That's what, that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To let Him control what I think, what I say, how I act. You see the contrast with getting drunk there, right? Don't get drunk. But what happens when we, when we fill up on alcohol? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, I have. Not for a long time. It's been a while. I promise. Okay, long time. College. Real long time. Okay, but but what happens when you when you get drunk? You alcohol takes control of you, right? You say things you normally would not say. It, it affects the way you your way you speak. It affects the way you think. It affects the way you walk. It affects the things that you do, right? Your judgment. Well, God, the Bible says, let the Holy Spirit control you. Be filled. Let the Holy Spirit uh, control how you think. Fill you up in such a way that, that, he, can, that, that, that he empowers and, and controls how you speak and how you walk and, 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 and what you think and, and your judgments. That's the concept of being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we get full of the Holy Spirit? It's right here in the text, right? Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. You see, being filled with the Holy Spirit begins with God's Word. This is where we, the Holy Spirit is the author of God's Word. If we fill up on God's Word, the Holy Spirit fills us up. And speak to each other. You might find this corny, maybe a little leave it to beaverish or something, uh, but on the way to church on Sunday mornings, we sing hymns in the minivan. We, it used to work better when the kids were literal or we were smaller, less self-consciousness, you know, especially if there's a friend in the car, just, you know, hang it up. It's just me and Christy. It's just a duet. They're not going to sing, right? <laughs> and of course, you know, the spawn of Satan, cell phones are also a distraction. Uh, instead of singing, you know, it's, it's here. But why do we do that? Why, why don't we sing you know, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Those old tiny ones, right? Anybody know that one? Come on. Yeah. Down at the cross, down at the cross, where my Savior. Right? Why do we do that? To be filled with the Holy Spirit. To, to let the Holy Spirit fill us. Sing, make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Sing, speak God's word to one another. Fill yourself up with God's word so that it flows out of you to others. That's the idea. That's how we get filled. Worship. Praise. Give thanks to God. Give thanks. I don't have anything to give thanks for. Yes, you do. Your heart's beating. Your lungs are sucking air. Your mind is working. Okay? Did you eat last night? Yes. Give God thanks. 
Did you sleep under a roof last night? Give God thanks. Did you sleep on a bed last night? Give God thanks. Why do I say that? Because 99% of the world can't say that. Do you realize that? You are, you're the 1%. We are the one. That, that, those are blessings from God. Begin with, with thanks and praise. And pray. Pray. Take a look at Luke. Chapter 11, verse 13. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You see, Jesus is saying this, As moms and dads, we're not holy like God is holy, right? We, 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 don't, we don't measure up to Him. But, but we still know how to be good to our children, right? We still know how to bless our children. And so Jesus says, well, just be a little logical here. Reason with me for a minute. If God is holy, if He is good, then ask Him and He will give you the Holy Spirit. He will bless you and, and, and all that the Holy Spirit brings with Him. Ask. So be filled with the Holy Spirit, then live or walk by the Spirit. As we keep ourselves filled with the Spirit, we will be empowered to walk by the Spirit. Let's look at that in uh, Galatians chapter 5. The Bible says, So I say, live or walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. So live or walk, if your translation might say walk by the Spirit instead of live, but the idea is, is to go about, to walk around, okay? Think about it, the, the Jews uh, in, in their history lived a nomadic lifestyle, right? And so a person's life was, was pictured as a path on which they walked, the way, the way they conducted themselves is, is our walk. Walk by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Draw your resources for life, your power for change in your life. Draw encouragement, joy, instruction, direction, all those things. Draw them from the Holy Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Does that make sense? Draw that. Be in touch. Right? How? Be filled with the Spirit. In God's Word. Meditating on God. Let it fill me up. That's how I draw from the Holy Spirit. Then follow, led by, follow the Spirit, keep in step, stay on the path the Holy Spirit has for you, has for us. Keep in step, walk in, 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 in the same direction, in the same pace as the Holy Spirit is leading us. So, so how, here's some directions for the, for the Spirit walk, to walk by the Spirit or to be led by or follow the Holy Spirit, okay? Because this is where our relationship with God, I like to say, gets, gets real time. It gets personal and practical, you know? It gets like now. Like, James, do this. Uh, go say this. Um, give that. Uh, don't buy that house. Buy this house. Don't take that job. Take this job. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to have input into your life in that way. It's real time. It's personal. It's practical. So what are the foundations and boundaries for that? This is the foundation of that. So if the Holy Spirit comes and says something to you that is not on top of this foundation, then it's not. You've misunderstood. If it's outside the boundaries of this, if it's contrary to it, then it's not, we misunderstood. You following me? Why? Because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. These scriptures, the prophets were born along by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is God-breathed, spoken by God. Okay? So it has to agree with this. It's the foundation and the boundaries. Let's look at that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. This is what God says to Abram about walking by him, walking, walking in his, in, before him. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, 
I am God Almighty. Walk before me. Live before me. And be blameless. So God says to Abram, you are always in my presence. Live like it. God says to us, we are all, you are always in my presence. As a matter of fact, I, my presence is always in you. Live like it. Walk it. Make every decision in reference to God. Take every step in life in reference to God. Jesus said it like this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, does that mean I need to pray about where I'm going to go to eat lunch? No. Right? We, we need to have some... some, some so we're not saying those kinds of things, but that's, that's important because some people, I think, have gotten off track with that a little bit. But in reference to God, but should I buy this house? Should I take that job? Should I go to this school or that school? You know, God has an opinion very often on those things. Sometimes he has a very definite opinion. Who should I marry? Should I marry this girl? Should I marry that guy? Is this even a... Is she even a candidate for marriage? Well, let's take that one, for instance, and just kind of walk through it. Number one, what does the Bible say about that? If I'm a, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that I should marry a follower of Jesus Christ. So that, that's kind of like decision maker number one, right? Is she a Christian? If not then that's not the direction of the Holy Spirit. Is he a Christian? If not, then that's not the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's not the direction to follow. If she is, good, check. You know, number one, good, she is. She's really good looking, God, please. You know? <laughs> Come on, right? Let's be honest. Okay, and so, it did, okay so, so is she... Is she walking by the Spirit? Sure, she, she has the Spirit in her. She's been given new life. She, but is she living? Because I, I'm living by the Spirit. I want to walk. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to have God's power work in me. Is she living that way? Are those her desires? Are those His desires? Yeah? Okay, another green light. Looks good. You know? Move forward. I heard one youth pastor say that, uh, great, I thought it was great advice. Here's how you decide who, if, you know, if, if you should marry or not, or who. Is, is you follow Jesus. You, you walk the path. You keep in step with the Spirit. You do what you, and, and you look around, and if you see a girl, you know, who's, who's right beside you, she, in other words, keeping up, doing the same thing. If you see a guy who's right beside you, that's a good candidate. Are your life, are your, is God's call, is God's direction on your life the same? You know, these things are, that's how God leads. I used to tell my students at Boston Baptist College, stay tuned to WGOD. <laughs> okay? Keep in step. Be filled with God's Word. Be doing what God has for you to do right now. Don't be stressed out about who am I going to marry, what am I going to do. Just be doing what God has for you to do right now. Right? Be walking, be, be obeying, be, be filled with God's Word and the Spirit. Then, when God speaks, you're tuned in already. You're going to hear. Right? That the problem is, is a lot of times God speaks and we're not tuned in. And so we, what does God want? That's the idea. So let me ask you. Will you? Will you do what you need to do to be filled with the Spirit of God? Will you do what the Bible says you need? You got to do in order to have God the, 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 the encouragement, the peace, the joy, the presence, the, the changing power of the Holy Spirit in you. Basically, will you meditate on, on these lists? I'm going to send out lists with, with verse references, just like I have the previous few weeks. Will you read through those once a day? Will you look up the verses? Will you see what God has? Will you discover what God wants to do in your life? Will you let Him fill you up? If you, if you will do that, make a commitment to yourself. Write that on your communication card. Drop it in the offering basket as it comes by at the end, at the end of the service. Do that. Make that commit, commitment to yourself and God. Make it a little concrete. Let me ask you something. Have you opened your door 
to Jesus Christ? Have you done, this is the first step. God wants to come into your life. He wants to forgive you. He wants to make you a new creation. He wants to make you his child. He wants you to make you a citizen of heaven in Christ's kingdom. He wants to uh, redeem for you from the power of sin. He wants to come in and encourage and give you joy, peace, strength, all those things. But we have to open our door first. We have to turn to Jesus and say, I, I, I'm guilty. Confession. Father, I've sinned against you. I've closed my door. We need to repent. God, I'm done with this closed door. I, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I want to follow you. Okay? Ask. When we do that, God forgives. We are saved. We, we become a new creation. Salvation occurs. God gives us new life. Ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. If, you, if God is leading you to do that right now, if, you, if you've never opened your door to God, to Jesus Christ, in that way, I'm going to lead us in a, small, in, a, in a short prayer right now, okay, to end our service. And just, just voice that prayer. You can voice it in your mind or pray as best you can to God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, first I just want to say thank you. We just want to thank you. For all that you have done and want to do in us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die and rise again to open your door to us. To me. Father, right now, as best I know how, I am opening my door to Jesus. I agree with you. I have closed my door on our relationship with you. I am I'm, I'm repenting. I'm turning away from that, God. From no longer do I want to live a closed door life. I want to live in full fellowship and in, in, in full of your Holy Spirit. Father, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for giving me a new life. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, two things. Number one, will you let us know on that communication card and drop it in the offering basket? We want to help you grow. Today is the day of your salvation. That's what the scriptures say. Number two is you need to take the first step of following Jesus, which is baptism. Repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We sign up and, and attend baptism class. All right? God bless. Have a great day.